So uh, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Megan McLaurin and I'm the programming coordinator at InterAccess. For those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, InterAccess is a gallery and production studio based in Toronto, dedicated to supporting emerging and experimental practices in new media art. I'd also like to recognize that the land on which InterAccess operates has been the site of human activity for 15,000 years. InterAccess is located in Toronto's Davenport neighborhood. Davenport Road maps the ancient Indigenous trail that linked Indigenous settlements and hunting and fishing grounds and trade routes along Lake Iroquois, which predates what's now Lake Ontario. Toronto is located in the Dish With One Spoon territory. The Dish With One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. At InterAccess, we acknowledge this treaty and remain critical of the ways in which it's largely been breached by settlers and newcomers. As uninvited guests on this land, we commit to the work of renewed Indigenous sovereignty. So uh, this is an online event, and I know uh, a lot of you folks are joining from places outside of Toronto, so you can learn more about the Indigenous territories, treaties, and languages where you are across and beyond Turtle Island at native-land.ca. Before handing things over to our moderator, Carrie, I'd like to introduce her to you all. Carrie Liao is a contemporary art curator and writer with an interest in public art, digital media, and printed matter. She was co-founder and curatorial projects coordinator for the Toronto Art Book Fair and has held positions including curator at Cape Breton University Art Gallery, resident curator at Artscape Young Place, artistic director of Contemporary Art Forum Kitchener and area and uh, curator in residence at the Textile Museum of Canada. She has written for V Days Art, Black Flash and C Magazine. And she's a graduate of the York University MA Art History with a curatorial practice program. So welcome, Carrie. I'll let you take it from here. Uh, thanks, thanks, Megan. Hi, everyone. My name is Carrie Liao, and I'm the curator of Geofenced. And I'm joined here by the five artists whose works are presented in the exhibition. And it's my pleasure to introduce them. Scott Benisine Abandon is an Anishinaabe artist originally from Abish. Abishi Gogang, Laksul First Nations. Scott currently works in experimental image making and sonic materials. His re current research interests are intersections of AI and Anishina Bemawin. Scott has completed international residencies at Parramatta Artists, Parramatta Artists Studios in Australia, Context Gallery in Derry, North Ireland, University Lethbridge Royal Institute of Technology I Air Residency, along with international collaborative projects in both the UK, Ireland, and Berlin. Scott has completed residencies with Initiative for Indigenous Futures at Abtec in Montreal. And Benicena Bandan has completed an MFA in photography at Concordia University and is currently working out of his hometown in Winnipeg. Kat Bloomkey and Jonathan Carroll make art about work and play. Taking form as video games, performance, and expanded reality, their project consider how technologies regulate both labor and leisure. They have worked together since 2013, often as collectives Spec Work Studio and Tough Guy Mountain. Exhibiting across Canada and internationally, they have shown recently with Rhizome and the New Museum's virtual reality platform, Mutech Montreal, and the 2018 Venice Architecture Biennale with the American Pavilion. Their practice has been featured in Hyperallergic, Canadian Art, 032C, The National Post, and Black Flash, and Art Times magazines. They have also received funding from Rhizome, the Canada, Arts, uh, Canada Council for the Arts, the Toronto Arts Council, Arts Nova Scotia, and SK Arts. Adrian Methusik is an interdisciplinary artist currently exploring ideas of representation, identity, and subjectivity through working with digital mediums such as augmented reality, video, sculpture, and interactive installation. She has an MFA from the Interdisciplinary Masters of Art, Media, and Design graduate program at OCAD University, and a BFA from the University of Ottawa with a specialization in new media art. And last but not least, Jen E. Norton 
is an artist using time-based media to create immersive experiential installations that reframe familiar objects, landscapes, and activities as fantastical dreamlike occurrences. Using stereoscopic interactive video, animation, augmented reality, sound, and kinetic sculpture, Norton's installation works explore the blurring boundaries of virtual and physical realms. Often using video as a starting point within her process, Norton's imaginative video compositions of disjunctive imagery are bound together in post-production using a combination of pre-cinema and contemporary display technologies. Recent national and international exhibitions include Lorna Mill's Ways of Something in Dreamlands, Immersive Cinema and Art, 1905 to 2016 at the Whitney Museum of American Art, in future at Ontario Place and Slipstream, a touring solo exhibition of new work premiering at the Robert McLaughlin Gallery. She is currently a PhD candidate uh, in visual arts at York University and an adjunct lecturer at Queen's University in the Department of Film and Media, specializing in 3D animation, AR, and video installation. So everyone is very accomplished. <laughs> Maybe what I'll do is have uh, each of the artists uh, state their name, where they're calling in from, and the name of uh, your artwork in Geofenced. Um, maybe we'll start with Scott. My name is Scott. Um, I'm calling in from Winnipeg. Uh, and my, the name of the work that in Geofenced is Shke Wabus, Look at the Rabbit. Oh, uh, we can go next. Uh, my name's Jonathan. I'm Kat. Um, we're calling in uh, from Regina in Treaty 4 territory, uh, and our project is Reality Crossing. Um, I'll go next. My name is Adrian. I'm calling in from Toronto, and my project is called Proxima B. Hi, I'm Jen Norton, and I'm in Kingston, Ontario right now, and my work is called in careful fitted ground. Great, thanks everyone. So just to give our audience a bit of context about Geofence, uh, the show was first conceived back in 2019. And at that time, most of the AR experiences I was encountering in a contemporary art context seem peripheral, meaning that it was being used as didactic or pedagogical tool in exhibitions where it didn't seem integral to the artworks. I was also coming across AR works that were commercially driven, making it seem gimmicky or like a vehicle for marketing or promotional purposes. And while there certainly are artists working critically with AR, there didn't seem to be an exhibition I'd seen or heard about, especially in Canada, that, entirely, that was entirely dedicated to the exploration and experimentation of AR as an artistic medium. So since then, there have been definitely a few initiatives, mostly led by uh, tech companies in collaboration with big institutions. There was Apple and the New Museum, and then more recently, Snapchat and LACMA. With this show, I was interested in seeing what an exhibition entirely made up of AR works could be on an intimate scale and developed with an approach that was solely driven by artists. So I approached these five artists to take up the challenge of creating AR work in consideration of geography, the landscape, or site specificity, um, as well as thinking about the question of how AR alters the environment, either by making spaces more accessible or creating new barriers. Uh, so with that being said, um, maybe I'll start with the question uh, for the panel. How did you approach your work? Uh, how did you approach this work? And uh, what did the challenge of this project mean to you and your art practice? Um, and maybe we'll start with uh, Scott again, if that's okay. And then we'll just follow the same order that we did last time. Sure. Um, so it was, a, it was a interesting timing. I think uh, it started maybe bef before COVID protocols were in place. So it was a sort of uh, wrapping your head around the idea of what, what work can be done from, you know, from your own home for a site specific sp space outside of the place that you might not go to see. So I think, um, I had some a little bit of experience from the year before uh, with an AR piece in Nuit Blanche in Toronto, but that was very just sort of uh, uh, translated really easily. So 
I had to really consider what, what was possible for technically because I'd have to work with somebody offsite or I couldn't engage with the site itself. And so I think there was a, there's a lot of a hesitancy in terms of what was possible in terms of an art practice. Um, but, you know, um, I think that was the biggest challenge was just to like, to not be in, in the place, not be face to face with the tech assistant or the uh, tech director for uh, the, the, uh, the help that I was getting. And so, yeah, I mean, but uh, I think that was the sort of the appeal of it too, is to see what can come out of it. So, um, so we've yeah we had worked uh, with AR a bit in the past, um, but not um, not like this sort of opportunity where we could really uh, focus on it as being the the total thing. Uh, we've done a lot of work with uh, filters for Snapchat or uh, Instagram before as part of, especially part of uh, Kat's practice. Um, so we are excited to think about uh, site specificity through AR. Um, and while that didn't, man didn't manifest in a project that uses uh, geofencing, which maybe we'll talk about later for us, um, our project was still very inspired by the relationship between uh, technology in general and the land and then um, thinking about specifically railways and augmented reality and their relationship to the terrain to the land that they overlay and then what sort of similarities and differences can you uh, can you think about in thinking about both those technologies um, yeah Um, for me, I had just finished uh, an AR project for my thesis project, and um, I had not really gotten a, like, I hadn't really gotten the chance to go super deep into making AR work. Like, I had made work that ended up being, like, not really visible for most people at the gallery and stuff. So, um, with this project, I kind of was looking to expand the themes that I had started looking into and then be able to make like an actually functional and shareable ARP. So like I ended up learning a lot about how to put it all together and um, it helped me refine the ideas that I'd started working on in the previous project. Um, I had begun using AR in 2018 um, with the with this, uh, it was actually at the Robert McLaughlin Gallery for um, a video installation, and it was kind of an additional component. Um, and since then, I began maybe not exclusively, but having a more concentrated focus on AR over the last few years. Um, I taught a couple of workshops here at InterAccess for people and it was really exciting to see how other people were using it because I had a really defined way that I was doing it and I was really excited for this show to see the different approaches people take to using even like a fiducial marker or something like that. Um, and I was also excited by the idea of having site specificity uh, be the guiding um, component of this show for my work, uh, which often um, uses uh, some type of mediated um, view, like some kind of apparatus to see what would normally be invisible. Um, and for me, it was really like rooted in the building, the history of that building, and uh, beyond the building, the um, what, what was there before in the underwater um, rivers and creeks that uh, are beneath the street level in Toronto. So it was a really exciting project to, uh, I had a lot of time <laughs> to think about and it changed so much over the course of how long, Carrie? Like a year? Like uh, like almost two years. Almost two years. Yeah. So um, yeah, it was, it was an interesting development. <laughs> It's true. Yeah. Thanks everyone for like bringing up the fact that, uh, yeah, we worked on this during the pandemic. And so we had a lot of time to uh, spend with our machines and technology. So it was actually like a pretty productive period in our lives, despite the stress of, you know, the pandemic things. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess maybe um, 
maybe if everyone could tell us about the work that you created for this exhibition uh, next, and uh, I can uh, present some audio visuals for, for our audience to look at as you, as you do that. So let me just share my screen. Here. And yeah, we'll start with Scott. Sure. The work I created for the exhibition. So when I was starting to think about geofencing, I was really thinking about um, what is sort of boundary making, right? Like what is what are the limits of um, when we code things and make these digital beings? What are what is our agency within that? What are their what is their agency? And I was just, I was doing a lot of research in other fields that sort of overlap these ideas. <laughs> there we go. It doesn't want to sit on the ground. Um, um, Dominic Petman's book, Look at the Rabbit, uh, Totem Technology Taboo, Taboo Technology, something. Dominic Petman. And uh, there's a story in there where he was talking about uh, in Lord of the Rings when they were sort of coding for these massive orc battles. Uh, there was these little weird glitches where even though each individual orc was, you know, coded and programmed to uh, behave in a particular way aggressively to fight each other, they would, they would find randomly out of a thousand paired up people or orcs, they would find two orcs that were pacifists, they would refuse to fight, you know, and so and then he provided these examples of these things where, you know, even if you, even with the certainty of code, there's still some seems to be some agency within these digital beings that will behave on their own give, given enough time and space. So then that was really sort of the, the impetus for this idea in terms of um, for the Anishinaabe, our sort of main creator, uh, not creator, but uh, one of our main uh, life givers is Nana Buju, and he comes as the form of a hare. So he is the ultimate fence uh, escaper. He doesn't really obey what, what we think as humans are to do those things. So um, the idea behind that is that despite all this technology that we can do, we can pre-plan everything, we can have all the layers in place and it still seems to want to do whatever it wants to do. So I think that was my sort of starting point. And so, um, and I was doing a lot of research and stories about a certain hair within a certain story called the, uh, talking about technology and sort of the gifts to the people. And so um, I settled, I sort of settled on this idea of the, the rabbit and sort of gift giving and sort of a bit of a more playful take on uh, AR, so. That's great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so this is our project uh, in the gallery um, as well. We also have that outdoor component. So the in, inside the gallery, um, the uh, the large print is the trigger uh, for the for reality crossing and within this piece you it's an interactive multiplayer game um, uh, and so you get assigned um, different roles and you kind of re uh, uh, revisit a simulation of uh, the process of the uh, building the railway um, in Canada. Uh, through either the lens of a land speculator or as a worker building the railway. Um, and the, we kind of came to this idea um, as well as the, maybe I'll talk about the outside piece when we see it, but um, we came to this idea because I'd read this like excerpt from Marx and Engels about um, communications when they were discussing how the railway really uh, augmented reality in a way to, in the sense that it was changing people's relation to like space and time because things were moving faster, people and their work was expected to keep up. Um, and so we were really familiar with this railway right here, um, uh, the DuPont corridor of the CPR because we used to live right against it and we were like our apartment was shaken all the time <laughs> um so uh we were interested we wanted to like do work on this site specific project um uh that involved the railway and we began reading more about this relationship between the expansion of canada uh like as a colonial nation but that was enabled through the railroad um, re also reading Harold Dennis's Empire and Communications was really helping us think through uh, technologies and how they were enabling certain, they would enable certain forms of control that was like materially connected. Um, and for Canada, of course, like the forging of the nation, like in this very violent way came through this con 
connection of um, the different colonies um, through the connected through the the, the line. Um, and we are also, so in 2019, when the project started, we just moved to where we are now, which is Regina. Um, and that uh, the railway is really important for um, like this location, Regina exists because of really shady politics and uh, the railroad specifically. Um, and it also, that railroad also connects to the want, to the line that our project is on behind InterAccess. Um, and the Canadian Pacific, the Canadian Pacific Railroad. Railroad. Um, and so that uh, we're really thinking with both like that interior game, which uh, that you see within the gallery, and then this project uh, that is outside, um, we are really thinking about our different experiences, one of like lear learning more of this, coming to this knowledge, um, like as a newcomer to the territory in, in uh, Saskatchewan, and then also like having kind of been moved out of pushed out of Toronto through the developments of um, these condos and, and such that were which is what you kind of go through a virtual condo showroom um, with our outdoor piece um, next to the rail. Uh, we are just kind of putting all these experiences together into two different interactive augmented reality projects, um, thinking about like augmented reality infrastructures, specifically the railroad as one of the past and um, the possible implications of like AR proper if the, for the future. Yeah, the outdoor portion is sort of the um, end state of the of the the story that began with speculative real estate at the outset of uh, Canada as a nation and an idea, and then the end state is this uh, this rail this train that is just all condo units and this total like commodification of housing of real estate. Um, uh, as a thing that you can uh, move around freely and you're free to uh, buy, sell and trade if you have the funds as well. So we sort of wanted to look at the, the past through the work in the gallery and, and think about this ongoing process that we're still a part of now and then create this uh, sort, of, sort of dystopian speculative piece for the outdoor portion uh, that would uh, yeah, uh, speak to this sort of lighthearted, but uh, still dark future. Um, fun fact, not really fun fact, but when I was asking for permission from Blood Brothers Brewery, which is where the uh, vinyl installation is installed, um, if we could make uh, create uh, put work onto their walls, they I had told them about the artwork and they said, uh, are you advertising uh, condos? Is this a real business? <laughs> And I had to like really convince them that we weren't a condo company. Um, so just like, you know, uh, to your point, like I think it's a very much a reality, like it's a dystopian that you've imagined, but it's like very believable. <laughs> we're not far off. <laughs> no, we're not. Adrian? Okay, so um, for this project, I um came up with the idea of a uh extraterrestrial resort um it's really built off a lot of the sort of work that i've been doing in my previous project which was like making science fiction spaces um and then uh with the limitations of that project i wasn't able to use a lot of the ideas so i kind of was able to recycle and rebuild off of some of the work that i had started then um and I, uh, yeah, like dealing a lot with the sort of advertising dystopia, uh, especially since like before we started the project, we didn't really know what space tourism might look like. And now that like every billionaire has gone to space, you kind of understand like how exactly that is going to look like. And um, it is going to be a very inaccessible experience for most of us. And so I came up with the, I was like, thinking a lot of like how this might look and what it might mean. And um, another thing that I thought about was like how putting these artificial like resort experiences into um, other planets and how those other planets might react. And so I have all this nice flashy imagery of the resorts from the promotion material. But then when you look into the AR, you see kind of like the live view of it where the environment has rejected the these luxury experiences um yeah i'm not really sure what else 
to say about it, but um, yeah, just like working on the concept of false advertising. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Um, why why the travel pop up kiosk as your installation? Um, well, I think it's like to create the feeling that like maybe you could go. I think like a lot of the reference images that I like took inspiration from were these images posted on social media of luxurious res resorts and like that kind of aspirational content that people like to post and consume as a way to be like oh, like maybe this is my little part of it. And um, by making it into a travel kiosk kind of like gives more the impression that like it might be accessible to you. You know, like if you can make a billion dollars in a year, then like maybe you could go to this resort and um, we can just sign up kind of like a believable or at least like internally consistent experience of being advertised this luxury vacation. Yeah, I, I love the concept and I think that it really ties well in with your billboard, this kind of just leaning into the advertising medium. Um, and it also has a bit of like a retro vibe to it, um, which I think also really adds to uh, the concept. Can, can I just say like the fact that less than a block away, they ever from Interaccess, they're advertising condos starting at 1.6 million. It's not that hard to imagine uh, advertisements for billion dollar space tourism yeah that's uh that's a very good point i mean even though you've kind of created these uh very uninhabitable uninhabitable worlds that are like have been overgrown with like mold and decay i, I actually still kind of want to visit and maybe that's something wrong with me but <laughs> you've you've uh, created such um uh interesting worlds to 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 discover jen um yeah, so there's two works. Uh, the um, this one that we're looking at right now uh, references. Well, they both reference that the former use of the building as a factory, um, Hamilton Gears. And um, when I was researching the area and what the what the history of it had been, I came across this um, this Toronto Star um, article uh, that speaks about the the change of the neighborhood in really dramatic <laughs> language and referring to the change um, from the manufacturing district as like a death of that neighborhood. Um, and I'll just read quickly uh, this enterprises as great as Eastern Airlines or as lowly as a corner store will often die pathetically with no cer uh, ceremony or celebration of their achievements. DuPont Street in Toronto at the close of the 20th century is an open graveyard of such industries, most of which collapsed with so much, with without so much as a pauper's funeral. Um, and that was a 1998 essay. Uh, it was originally a 1998 uh, essay for Tattle Creek Magazine. And uh, they go on to say, their skeletons lie exposed. They are parking lots, warehouse, loft condos, and retail joints of the post-industrial age. Um, and I wanted to show kind of like a ghostly image of the gears um, and to take a poet, a poem about change um, that I felt kind of spoke to um, maybe like it could be applied to the different waves of the industrial revolution um, from a poet, uh, Emily Dickinson. So the words that you see inscribed on the gears as they're turning are the quatrains of this um, poem um, that Emily Dickinson wrote. And one of the lines is in careful fitted ground. Um, what we're looking at right now uh, references the cooling pools in the basement of the building where they would uh, put the hot gears in to cool their alloys. Um, and I wanted to show uh, this not only as a reference to the water of the tanks below, but also of Garrison Creek and all the waterways that have been covered up in the different um, iterations of Toronto's evolution. Um, and some of them are coming out like sprightly. <laughs> little crystalline fairies or something, while others are uh, the, um, disappearing into the recesses of the dark, the dark pool below. Um, I don't know if I should, if we can 
go into more detail later, but I feel like I hope that gives a good uh, description of what of what we're looking at here. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a that's a great uh, description, and I, I think I've mentioned this to you before, but I think it's incredible that you've taken um, a medium like AR or even digital digital work in general that is often like pretty cold or can be alienating to a certain extent, like aesthetically, and kind of in, um, embodied it with this kind of spirit, um, especially like the spirit of um, you know Toronto's past and Toronto's history. So I, I think that's um, uh, something of, of of note about your work. Oh, thank you. It was also um, Emily Dickinson has such a, like a personal voice um, and like she's a precursor of imagist poetry and I feel like that really ties it into nature. And although the change from this physical structure, this architecture was a factory, there's also what was there before, which is also important to um, the work and just how technology can uh, shape a neighborhood and shape how we feel about something and even to review it in sort of a romantic or at least a sentimental way uh, kind, I hope will bring in more aspects than just the business side of what once was because um, it represents people and their how they were working in, in different conditions and the different waves of what industrial revolutions mean to people and um, their lived experience. So, yeah, I love that. Um, I'm just gonna stop sharing this. Um, I think maybe some of our audience members, you know, as artists or creative technologists, uh, might be interested um, in maybe hearing about, um, you know, what kind of softwares uh, you or tools that you use to create uh, your works. Um, yeah, so maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Should we continue with the order <laughs> or should we sure, just yeah, let's, do the, let's do the order, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just use the basic Blender, Unity, Photoshop, <clears throat> Audio, Audacity stuff. So you know, nothing really special or specialized, so. Nice, was there anything, cause you had mentioned at the beginning of our panel that, you know, you, this was your first foray into AR, um, you know, aside from like the Nui Blanche work that right. you did, was there anything new that you had to like learn or like a learning curve? Uh, well, I had to buy a new phone because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my old phone wasn't just wasn't cutting it. So there was a, there was a huge thing in terms of like it was a totally new software package in terms of AR foundations and things like that. And uh, so there was a pretty steep learning curve in terms of what, what's the capacity of each individual, like the planes identification, which worked in my studio, but didn't work outside of things sometimes. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I had to buy a new phone as well because uh, otherwise, like the it just kept crashing. So yeah, that's probably one um, inaccessibility about AR and possibly other digital works. Mm -hmm. uh, Cat and John. Yeah, we bought two uh, new phones. We bought two new phones. <laughs> An <laughs> Android and a and a iPhone. <laughs> one came courtesy of. Um, of another AR uh, project. <laughs> yeah, our friend Jeremy Bailey bought us a new iPhone for contributing to his project UAR. Um, and then we just bought an Android phone to make sure Steph was working on that as well. So yeah, uh, there, um, yeah, there's all so many crazy barriers that exist to even viewing this uh, mm -hmm. sort of art, um, but- Which we realized when putting stuff on the gallery's iPads because they didn't yeah. work, <laughs> they're yeah. too out of date. <laughs> yeah, shout out to um, Luke for helping us out with the iPhones um, that we're using at the gallery to view the work as well. That's super helpful mm -hmm. because yeah, otherwise you're just forcing people to own uh, devices that are newer than a certain point, uh, which is not what you want to be doing. But we uh, also, yeah, so all of the all of these projects were um, made in Unity uh, in one degree or another. Um, and, and the app was that it's built on is made in Unity. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time using, so um, uh, first time for me really using this thing called uh, uh, AR foundation or framework. <laughs> um, I can't remember what the thing I use is called, but uh, this is a, a sort of a, 
uh, a thing that Unity uses that lets you create uh, augmented reality apps for both iOS and Android devices. Whereas before, when I've built AR projects before, um, I had to have two totally separate projects running, uh, uh, one for that was just pointing towards an Android uh, build platform and another that was pointing towards an iOS build platform. And so that was really um, not, I, that was not ideal at all. So uh, just since um, we started working on Geofenced, uh, Unity came up with this, yeah, AR framework uh, that um, lets you build to all platforms at once. So that was really helpful and uh, pretty streamlined to use. Like it's, we, uh, all were using image trackers and the way it dealt with image trackers was straightforward. Um, so yeah, we were, we were, we were using uh, Unity also because we have a, a, a game, game design is a big part of our practice and um, wanted to make that uh, a, a part of the indoor component as well, um, which is this game you can participate in either by going to the gallery and using the trigger there or also picking up one of the uh, zines that we've created that are also at the gallery and you can sort of lay them out into a map that then you can look at through the app and and play in the this um, multiplayer world together. So there's all these different sort of things that we were using Unity for specifically as a game engine and as a tool for building augmented reality apps. We used Yarn Spinner for the first time, really. Yeah, yeah we're using this mm -hmm. tool in Unity for creating interactive uh, narrative dialogue stuff, which is what powers all the text elements in both our games. So you have this conversation with this character in our outdoor component, he's called the condo conductor. Um, you sort of tap through this conversation where there's some dialogue tree elements. And yeah, for that, we use this really awesome uh, uh, open source program called Yarn Spinner that plugs into Unity really well. And um, for all the cat made all the graphics in Illustrator, uh, which is a funny, she had to make up her ho this whole system for doing pixels in Illustrator because it's not set yeah. up to uh, make pixel art with, but it's cat cats a, a master at Illustrator. So she uh, went, yeah, went with that software, but made up her whole this whole grid system that was very complicated. But, <laughs> it was, uh, great maybe results. next time I wouldn't do that, but I will. <laughs> I don't know. Push it well. to the limit. <laughs> Not something probably if you were working on a team with other people, it'd be a hard thing to, to show other people how to do. But when it's just you working, I, I think it worked out really well. And um, then we rendered these videos, um, the ones that are behind mm -hmm. us. Uh, so we shot them using a drone uh, and wanted to just create a part a video uh, portion of the project that would um, uh, sort of explore the aesthetic that we were going for in the game uh, more and then also um, uh, just make it explicit this connection between like thinking through the land and especially thinking through the uh, land and the prairies and the overlay of uh, technology on top of the land and what just what that looks like from from this sort of bird's eye perspective that again was uh, for us imitating the perspective that you have when you're playing our indoor portion of the game where you have this strategic view of the map which i think is um uh you could characterize it especially when you're thinking through video games as this like settler colonial perspective where you're looking you're you're looking from a place of mastery over this uh terrain that uh is fulfilling a power fantasy in the player traditionally in these sorts of games mm -hmm. where there is this sort of god view on the land so we want to create that with the videos and yeah just used uh after effects to make the videos incredible so so many different softwares i feel like people who um you know are te creative technologists probably this is like nothing new to them that you have to use many different softwares to like create this kind of work but perhaps for people who don't make the work it's like wow it's a lot um adrian um so i also used unity and blender um when i worked on my previous project all there was AR Foundation hadn't been released on Unity yet. So I basically only made it on AR core, AR core, which was only working on like phones that were two years old or something. So it's like already so nice to be able to work on AR Foundation that can work on more phones and like be able to, uh, you can still interact with it. Um, 
the main thing that I learned this round was um, about texturing models. Like I had started modeling environments and stuff in 2018-ish, and um, I had never really gotten the hand of making the textures like to be able to go into Unity. So with my previous project, all the models were the same color. It was just kind of like flat. And so it was really fun to be able to get into like actually texturing the things. And then for the like degraded versions of the projects, I did a lot of like hand painting in Blender, which was super fun too, to like add the color in the specific spots and then coming up with uh, these like detailed texture maps that could be applied. Um, and yeah, yeah, AR Foundation is really good. <laughs> Great, thanks, Adrian. Jen? Um, I usually use Cinema 4D, but this time around I used Blender. And I have to say, I've, I'm falling deeply in love with Blender. I also used it for a recent project um, in which I was modeling characters and the sculpting um, brushes and using it with Wacom tablet is so, so dreamy. I don't know, I just recommend it to anyone. <laughs> and also I love that it's free. Uh, and the reason why I used Blender this time instead of Cinema 4D was because I wanted to create a gear chain that worked uh, with it. It actually works within the geometry of the gears um, so that I applied constraints on um, the driving gear and the others would follow. Um, and you can bring the Blender project right into Unity, which you can't do so easily anymore with Cinema 4D and you can't really export it as I don't know if I'm going too nerdy on this but I'm sure some people in here are interested like when you're using constraints and drivers and that sort of thing you can't just export it as an FBX and it all the only one will work and so to have the the all that work in Unity was really great um uh what else did i use yeah i was the enfant terrible and i used vuforia um and i'm <laughs> and that's why my uh one of the reasons why my uh two works are not on the app because they're not working with ar foundation they cancel each other out um so i think in the future i will make that switch uh to ar foundation um and I don't know if there's anything else to tell you about technology in terms of what I used because it was pretty much just Blender and Unity. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, for audience members who don't know, we created, Kat and John created an exhibition app for Geofence. Um, and, and the idea behind that was that we wanted um, the viewing experience of the works to be streamlined. So you didn't have to download a bunch of different apps um, onto your phone to see the works. But um, as Jen mentioned, she used Vuforia, which was like a different software uh, than what the other artists had used. And it was um, not compatible uh, with um, the app that John and Kat had created. So that's why when you go see the, wor uh, the work or if you've already seen the work, that's why it's her app is like, her work is separated from the main exhibition app. A, lot, a huge learning curve in terms of like publishing an app. I, I didn't realize that it had to go through so many different um, uh, checkpoints like uh, Apple asked had we really had to like justify to Apple that the that the app was um, uh, of uh, that it was like needed to be on the app store like because it wasn't something that people could buy they just didn't understand it and like Kat and John can go more into that process but if you're looking to publish an app make sure you a lot, like, I don't know, a month or two months um, in terms of the approval process. And in fairness, maybe I didn't give anybody enough time for any of that <laughs> with my work. So. No, no, it's, we should, yeah, well, I blame it on Apple. Let's just blame it on Apple. The other thing I would say too, is I use GitHub a lot with uh, Luke because he was assisting me. So um, Luke Garwood, so yes. GitHub was an essential sort of thing. So. Same. Got it. Um, so I'm just looking at the time now, 12.54. Um, Megan, do we, is it, do we only have five minutes left? How much time do we have left? We have until uh, 1.30. So um, 
so yeah, uh, if folks have questions, you're welcome to kind of like ask them in the chat. Um, or Carrie, if you have any other questions for our panelists. Yeah, I mean, I have lots of questions, but I, I guess I also want to leave time for our audience to ask questions. Um, maybe uh, we'll skip a little, skip some of my questions, and maybe I'll go to one that I think is interesting, which is, um, you know, AR is often compared to its cousin VR, and I've heard like recent um, tech companies and people in the industry talk about how AR is a solution to VR's immersive experience that has been criticized for cutting off people from the rest of reality. And so with AR, you're very much still a part of the environment, but it's just enhanced by computer generated elements. So as artists, do you think that AR truly enhances the world around us? Um, and if so, is it important for the art community to be more invested in like learning and using this technology? Um, for me, I would think one of my favorite points of learning AR was in the initial phases. I forgot that AR Foundations was running the program on my phone because I wasn't familiar. And I had a backyard fire set up and I pulled out my phone to take a photo of the fire. And this rabbit just sort of popped up beside the fire, just sitting there, you know? And for me, that was a moment where I was like, oh, this is feels really warm and inviting and feels like there's a living being in, in my sphere, you know? Um, it sort of that kind of sold me on the potentials of what AR can do in terms of uh, literally an augmented uh, alternate reality without leaving the space. So um, there is potential there for sure in terms of uh, sort of seamlessly incorporating new things into the world without having to put on the goggles and uh, leave this reality in such a wholehearted way. So, yeah, we uh, yeah we sort we began in v working in VR um, before we started in AR. So we like began working in VR back in 2016, um, and then that was of course the year that Pokemon Go came out, and we realized wow, it is so like people are very obviously the app was a draw, but uh, it was. Uh, just kind of trying to get people like into the VR headset versus uh, just asking people to pull up their phone. Uh, we we started then l actually looking at VR for mobile and moving more towards the AR space. Um, I think, uh, of course, now with the pandemic, it's really hard to get people into a VR headset in a public gallery space. So I think there's a lot of potential for AR audiences to grow because of that. Um, but I think still with just um, the kind of active, like the activity that you m need to do in a gallery space, AR um, might still find some challenges within, like just like fitting into an exhibit if you have to do more steps to see the AR work versus the other work perhaps. Um, yeah, and in, in general, it's possibilities like, although they're exciting, um, there's so many barriers in the way uh, that it like that come coming just from our the, the way that our society is structured in general, like needing these expensive phones, mm -hmm. uh, this like gatekeeping app store thing. Um, yeah, the, the apps are so uh, limiting if you want to have it like it's easy to put a single uh, VR device it with a, or it's easier to put a single VR device with a, uh, with something preloaded on and into a gallery space, um, but more challenging if you're asking like a bunch of, for, if you want 20 iPhones <laughs> yeah. to run it. <laughs> so it's like, as a medium, it's possibilities are still very restricted by both hardware and software and capitalism. <laughs> Uh, when I first started getting into AR, I did a bunch of research into VR as well to kind of figure out which direction I wanted to go in because I felt like with both AR and VR, there's so much potential to talk about the differences or overlapping or intersections of virtual and physical spaces. And I ended up settling on AR because I liked that um, you kind of end up looking through the screen of your phone instead of like at the screen of a VR headset and it becomes sort of like a filter to see the world in. And then um, I also liked in AR because you can see your environment, you're like have to be more aware of your physical environment because with VR, if you're going to run into a wall because it's not there in VR, you're going to run into the wall. But in AR, 
you can kind of, you have to pay attention to that wall because you can also see it. And then so you kind of become like extra aware of your physical environment to be able to interact with the digital environment. And so I thought that that was really interesting. And I think that there is still a lot of potential, like there is a lot of potential. And, um, but it's like so annoying with the technology thing because like forcing people to get new phones is awful. And um, I just hope that, I don't know, there's no, they're pro it's not investment. It's not a smart investment for technology companies to be able to retrofit their older technology, but like, it would be cool if that was possible. Um, the reason why I started using AR was because it worked for the concept of each project that I was doing. I, um, I feel that my practice is kind of like a, a project based <laughs> practice. And I try to choose the medium that works best to, to achieve um, what I want to communicate with the audience and the interaction and the experience that I want to make. And a lot of my work before was using things like Pepper's Ghost, um, uh, maybe in 2010. Uh, I, I, don't, I guess it doesn't matter where it showed, but it showed in a few places and it was really about bringing um, the virtual or like video um, uh, presence into the same space as the viewer, or at least even in an illusionistic kind of way. So the superimposition of um, the augmented reality, the augmented content like really appeals to what the way that it was working already um, to like often I'm addressing figures in history that had been forgotten somehow or overlooked or their work was attributed to someone else um, in, in like a higher power <laughs> um, position. Uh, so it was a way of kind of like uh, bringing that history into into view through some kind of like concentrated experience where somebody's having a one to one relationship on with it on a device. And I think like AR and VR are very different um, experiences, of course. Uh, and I don't I, I don't really compare them as like as one better as one worse, because I think that they do different things. But on a personal note, I'm extremely farsighted <laughs> and <laughs> and claustrophobic. So um, although like I really appreciate <laughs> VR, it's not something that I like feel very physically comfortable creating, although I'm sure that it's something that I'll explore more in the future. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers a question. I sort of went on a tangent there. <laughs> no, no, that's a good point. Yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, VR, I remember when I first tried it too, I felt very car sick <laughs> and motion sickness. And maybe that's just me, but like, I don't get that with AR necessarily. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, thanks everyone for, for your thoughtful answers uh, to my question. I guess I'll uh, turn it over to the audience to see if, there, if they have any questions for you all. I see one in the chat. Um, we talked a little bit about this, but uh, how do you think about the future of your AR work and the issue of techno technological obsolescence? Um, I'm wondering how this work enters into the archives or museum collections uh, and how it's stored and conserved um, does it resist typical trajectories or economies of art? So yeah, how do you how do you envision your work being shown in the future? I've dealt with this, and I basically <clears throat> for the VR project I did it in 2016, and I at a certain point I just gave up trying to make it work on, you know. So it's there. There's documentation photos. There's documentation video, but at a certain point it becomes obsolete, and it becomes you can't just hire a team to keep it updated consistently so i think working with this is kind of an ephemeral ish technology right it's it's here it's now um at some point it becomes um not a living thing it becomes a thing you can revisit so for me i just live with that idea that it might not exist as it exists now in like five years or six years or two years even so yeah i'm also or we are also pretty uh pessimistic about the long term uh, viability of these as interactive projects and not as sort of like documentation. Um, like there's, um, we make a lot of 
apps as part of our art practice. Mm -hmm. And you have to, as every new version of the mobile operating systems are released, as App Store um, uh, terms of services change, <laughs> your, 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 the, the app, your app becomes unusable on the device. So it might not even be a, there might be a technological limitation. It might be a, a limitation uh, of the like TOS, uh, the limitations of platform capitalism just make it so that these things in the system that we use right now aren't going to last. The, the option that we've been thinking of is like having basically like a specific machine that uh, is designed to archive these things and like keeping it having a specific uh, either it's a specific device like a phone where you don't update the operating system mm -hmm. but then that means that you can't put new stuff on it has to be like this this is just the phone for geofence we're never going to update it from ios 14 or whatever it's at now um yeah like you have to sort of freeze the hardware in mm -hmm. place uh, never connected to the internet again so that's what ha so we got the new phones and then our old phones uh that ha run our old apps from like 2016 to like 2020 they're like okay these are just the archive although they also have they're also our, our own phones so they're also a bit smashed and din dinged up but uh that's the that's the museum archive <laughs> but in it, i mean interesting to think of how the um, institutions mm -hmm. uh, could uh, contribute to that. Um, they're on the side of like the software, there's like uh, Rhizome's efforts with mm -hmm. Conifer to create these um, uh, in browser web art archiving tools. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, there's yet to be, or like there's still like a lot of work to be done in thinking of like solutions for every possible mm -hmm. thing because different different uh uh projects just have so many different requirements um i'm okay with my project becoming inaccessible at some point i think that if it's for what it's about and what it does so like i'm all right if it moves to being just documentation but at the same time like because the ar is basically just a window into an environment i can always transfer that environment to a VR space or to web VR or something else so that it becomes, so it can be like converted to something that is maybe more stable, but at the same time, like, I think I kind of like the mystery of it just being like kind of gone and then you have to fill in the bl blanks with like how it might feel to interact with um, because especially for like I think all of the works that we're making, like it's about site specificity and also like time specificity. And like the, for me, the conversation of space tourism, like in a year is gonna be completely different anyway. So it makes sense that it's kind of like frozen in this moment in a way. Yeah, uh, one of the changes that have happened in my life since um, Carrie first approached me is that I, began working for Queen's University and I was really excited to become part of this um, digital born initiative uh, and um, I'm working with a vulnerable media lab which uh, is a facility at Queen's University that's um, specific to pre um, preserving maintaining and housing uh, film media, but also um, looking to how we can, for those who want it, not everybody wants their work to live forever, <laughs> um, but it's nice to have a choice. And to, so we're consulting with uh, people that specialize in the field and also with artists working um, kind of in isolation to see like uh, how, it, it, how something could be um, facilitated to have something like a GitHub or something like an emulator that like that could encapsulate works into the f in to the future so that the information is all there. But then, you know, some things are based in objects as well, so they don't really translate outside of their their files in isolation. So it's a really fascinating area um, for, for me at this time when I'm restoring old films and video work and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, 
it's there is an obsolescence that occurs when you're working with large companies, especially. Um, but I think that it's important to um, to at least think about how we. I just thinking about like the early days of gaming and people that were working on their own, like even Twine games and that sort of thing, and just like some things are lost that were really radical works. Um, made by people working on the fringes that uh, it would it's like it's very heartbreaking to think of those works that are just lost um, uh, and we can only kind of look at stills and that sort of thing so with some of my works I want them to disappear <laughs> but in, in, from the past when you're first learning a technology but yeah so that's it yeah I think I uh, can relate Jen, to your sentiments, I feel very torn about um, digital works, AR, the works that you've created being um, uh, ephemeral, you know, to a certain extent, like, you know, I really like, uh, what I liked about public art or art in public spaces is that they were ephemeral. So in my mind, you know, they kind of escaped this, the like capitalism or commodification, but, uh, but what happens when, you know, that's not, um, it's not a factor with your works and then you just want to kind of preserve it because you really like the work and you want people to see it in the future for, you know, posterity or for learning or for education and, and, and for, for history. So I, I feel very on the fence about um, the ephemerality of, of digital works and AR works. Or for even to give people who are, who are working in, in their own ways, like some kind of, some, some kind of resource that like, if they so chose to have it, um, cared for, you right. know, these works might be, um, you know, made by somebody who is not yet known, um, but their work might have like uh, importance. Oh, there go my guinea pigs. I'm sorry, they're going crazy. And Matt, like we only see in retrospect how much how much they um, work saying and what their value is and what and unfortunately, this often only happens in hindsight. It's true, posthumous artists. I hadn't thought of that. It's true. Well, any archivists in the room, like, feel free to chime in. Let us know if there are any strategies I've, that you're. I have, a, I have a dream that um, one of the things I think about AI using AI as a self updater, where it knows it's you know all the coding and all all the codecs and all those things that, but it can identify what the new codec is and will sort of evolve itself and keep itself updated based on. The new input so all you have to do is input it and by itself it sort of self-generates it's new and it keeps it transposed to the new iteration of whatever that technology is in the future so i mean not there anywhere close to that yet but i think it'd be a good use of sort of ai and it's sort of i, I really like that i really like that idea of uh, ai kind of taking over well not to replace archivists necessarily but as a tool for archivists um to kind of update uh, like the work to like the present technology or the technology of the future. I wonder if that like is like a slippery slope though, because like once, you know, AI gets like too intelligent, what if it changes the work or what if it like, you know, becomes the artist? I mean, I guess there's that kind of- yes, Have at it, have at it. <laughs> oh, have at it, you're into it? Yeah, okay. All of our work becomes like data moshing and deep dreamy. <laughs> um, there's also like something that would be nice if, if AR could exist outside of using a device, like maybe this, like a holographic technology or something like that. And then people who just walk into a space can see it as opposed to like, you know, they got the fanciest smartphone available. It's true. Um, okay, I have another question here in the chat box. In terms of accessibility, do you find an AR app to be more accessible versus trying to find a way to use AR through the web or a web browser? That's changed a lot since we started working on this project. Um, the sort of uh, web, uh, like, uh, what's it called? Three, uh, th three JS, like ja JavaScript, 3D stuff in browser um, that can render as like AR um, artwork that can render out uh, an AR object, like a 3D object, uh, just by going to an HTML as at least something 
something that I've learned to do only over the past uh, six months or so and started seeing more and more, yeah, r more recently. Um, whereas when we were start, like we've sort of been working with AR since 2016 or so and always been struggling with this question of how do we make something that people can easily access because there's been a sort of series of different um, bad apps that you can uh, sort of like upload your own AR things and your own triggers mm -hmm. to, um, but then they always end up getting bought up by like either Adobe or HP and then shut down so that they could eventually come out with their own more proprietary solutions. Um, so those, we tried those for a while. And then at the outset of this project for us, it was like, okay, making an app that we can like put all this stuff together on seems like it's the, at the time is the most, uh, accessible path. Mm -hmm. And additionally, uh, more accessible towards the artists because, um, because we were all sort of familiar with working with unity already. And then also unity provides all these, uh, is a good interface for building interactions and, and stuff. Uh, whereas um, the to build out interactions in like browser based uh, 3D canvas rendering stuff um, is a, I, I don't have any experience doing that. And it's, uh, I don't know what the, I don't know what the interfaces are for building out like interactions in, in that uh technology but definitely going forward that's something that i've been thinking about more and more and wanting to figure out a way that we as artists could work with ar through links um i mentioned yeah we mentioned uh uh jeremy bailey who is uh another artist from toronto who's like been working with ar for such a long time like since since the aughts and he's been doing a lot of stuff using um yeah, just browser based AR and most recently uh, is working on an interesting project uh, of browser based AR that is built on top of like an NFT platform uh, too. So that seems to, I would say that is probably where the future is going in terms of just AR that could that lives at a URL rather than on an app. But um, yeah, we work with the tools we have. <laughs> yeah, another artist working this way is Marpy. I don't know if people are familiar with Marpy Studio, um, but it makes it accessible for people in and out of the gallery to interact with a lot of the um, projections. And he works with augmented reality a lot. But if anybody's interested, you can just I'll just leave the Marpy Studio in the chat. <laughs> Um, well, that was the last question from the public, uh, from the audience, unless if uh, anybody else wants to ask questions in there, maybe, um, maybe I'll end on like a wrap up question, which is, what are you working on now? And what's next for you? Is it AR related or not? <laughs> um, yeah. I know um, I'm not working on anything AR related, um, just kind of personal projects, doing a lot of research in the research phase for a couple of projects right now. So um, yeah, I think nothing great to, to report at the moment, so. Sorry, uh, I was just typing in. <laughs> So, so much cringy self-promotion. Um, we just, this, uh, we uh, on, only uh, yesterday successfully published the Reality Crossing onto the App Store. Again, this sort of like annoying crap with the with with Apple, Apple <laughs> with gatekeeper, gatekeeping platforms. Yeah. Um, so you can download the app uh, from realitycrossing.app onto iOS devices, still waiting on the uh Google Play Store validation. It's also on the phones at the at Interaccess Gallery if you do head in there to use mm -hmm. it. So if this is a, a beta version of this game we're working on. Uh, you can play it there. Um, uh, we're uh, we're working on another AR project right away. Actually, yeah, um, it's a it's a comic book for the, another collective that we work in that Carrie mentioned, Tough Guy Mountain. Um, it's an and it's uh, yeah, comic book that's. Um, 
has this AR element to it where you uh, looking through your the the comic through your phone. Uh, this all these other uh, narrative elements uh, pop out, and we're really uh, it was nice that we got to do this project and really get our um, uh, sort of get our uh, muscles AR muscles uh, working because we're going to be continue using that for this comic book that we're publishing. It's happening uh, coming out in November and being published through I Level Gallery in Halifax, another great artist run center. Um, yeah, so you can play our app at realitycrossing.app. And then we also have a bunch more video games that you can play at. Our yeah, go to www.spec.work to uh, sign up for the mailing list to get notified about the AR comic book. <laughs> yeah, I'll drop, our, <laughs> that. I'll drop our itch page where you can play some more of our games in the chat as well. I'm starting research into making VR, so we'll see how that can relate. Um, I like to keep working in AR, but um, I'm interested to see how the two can work together or, yeah, so that's my new research. Um, I have to finish my PhD, ah, so I'm working towards having uh, a a book object that uses the text as um, fiducial markers for aug augmented reality experience, but also to some of my immersive video work. And um, oh my gosh, I can't wait to be done that. And then I plan to sleep for a long time, but I'm also taking um, an, an artificial intelligence course um, online through Oxford University that starts in October. Oh, and motion capture suits. Uh, one of, I have access to some of that. So I will be using and learning Rococo um, motion cap suits, uh, using it with Blender and Unreal. And yeah, so uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Very exciting. I uh, can't wait to see all of the work that comes out of that research and the, the kind of new education you're pursuing. Um, I guess everyone can uh, all, uh, everyone can stay up to, date, uh, up to date with all the artists' work on their website. Um, that's probably the best way. And yeah, I think we'll wrap it up unless there's any other questions. Just wanted to say a public thank you very much, Kari, for bringing us all together and persevering through some challenging times, but yeah. Thank you. Likewise, I mean, I can't believe we made it through. We're here. We're all alive. And uh, yeah, we produced a show that was postponed just once, but uh, was postponed. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, thank you to all the artists. Thank you to InterAccess, especially Megan, who, uh, yeah, was a great help and support. Thank you all so much. Uh, it's been such a joy to hear more about the work. Um, and I also want to invite everybody watching to come by the gallery to check it out. InterAccess is uh, located at 950 DuPont Street in Toronto and our hours are Tuesday to Saturday from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. So I encourage you to come by and say hi and to see the works for yourself in person. <laughs>